Good evening or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, one of a series of webinars in the road to HINAC 5. Tonight's webinar is going to be an update on MHS and HIV criminalization. And this tonight's webinar, this afternoon's webinar, is being hosted and organized by the US people living with HIV caucus. And joining me tonight and welcoming everyone is the vice chair of our steering committee, Martha Cameron. And Martha will give a quick intro on the caucus. Martha, next slide. Hi, everyone. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a really important topic and so much has happened. Um, thank you, Ronald, for that introduction. And um, of course, you can see here the people that are listed um, that are participating, Ronald Johnson himself, who is uh, the co-chair, um, Amir, uh, who is coming to us from the Center of HIV Law and Policy, and Justin Smith, uh, who is um, the co-chair of the Pacha Stigma and Disparity Subcommittee, and uh, as well as the Positive Impact Health Center's director and Kelly Flannery from the Positive Women's Network. Uh, she is a policy director. Next slide. So the people living with HIV caucus, as you can tell from the name is comp comprised of many organizations and networks, uh, clients, groups of people, as well as just independent advocates living for uh, with HIV. We absolutely believe in and are predicated upon the principles of self-empowerment and self-determination. Next slide. Um, we are organized, led by, and um, absolutely represent and accountable to people, uh, all people living with HIV and all their diversities. You can see from um, the organizations listed here um, that represent many different um, forums and groups um, of people living with HIV. Next slide, please. Uh, if Thanks. we could just go back one slide real quick. Um, I know we're going to be hearing a lot about, um, um, you know, M MHS from, from the panel, but I just wanted to say that the, the, the people living with HIV caucus did uh, produce an amazing policy agenda in which we spoke about MHS and just want to quickly ground us by saying that this is an issue that absolutely needs to be um, meaningfully involve people living with HIV in the conversation because of how it concerns us um, and centers us. And um, as, as you will hear, I'm sure, um, we have very specific concerns um, about how it has been implemented and how that impacts people living with HIV. So I just wanted to go ahead and at least uh, ground us in that. Thank you very much. I'll hand it back over to Ronald. Thanks, Martha. And our first presenter will be Amir Sadaki. Uh, and as Martha indicated, Amir is from the Center for HIV Law and Policy, and he will give us some more grounding in MHS and how it relates to HIV criminalization. Uh, next slide, and we can start with Amir. Over to you, Amir. Thank you so much, Ronald. Thank you, Martha, as well. I I'd really like to to thank the US People Living with HIV Caucus for inviting the Center for HIV Law and Policy to be a part of your Road to HINAC webinar. It's an exciting year. I think it's gonna be an important year to mobilize and, and organize um, on this issue specifically of, of molecular HIV surveillance. Um, so my name's Amir, I use he, him pronouns. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how HIV criminalization affects uh, you know, and interacts with a lot of the concerns that people living with HIV have about molecular HIV surveillance. Next slide. And thank you, Tammy, for, for handling that. Um, there we have on our uh, um, CHLP website uh, a fact sheet that is a handy resource for you to have um, if you're thinking about meeting with your state and local health department, if you're thinking about meeting with 
local lawmakers who you uh, regularly meet with and talk about issues relating to um, HIV criminalization, issues related to um, and affecting you as, as communities of people living with HIV, this might be a really handy fact sheet to, to bring along. So you can find it on our website, hivlawandpolicy.org. Um, next slide. And before we dig a little, you know, before we dig any deeper, I think it's it's helpful to to bring folks up to speed who might be, you know, in need of a refresher on what is molecular HIV surveillance. Maybe that's something I've heard about before. I've heard it in planning council meetings. I've heard it in coalition meetings. You know, all the wonderful, amazing advocacy resources from the caucus and from Positive Women's Network um, references this. But what is it? MHS or molecular HIV surveillance is it's really simply uh, the use of individual HIV treatment resistance data or your individual drug resistance information and data to, uh, to guide public health action. It's the public health use of, of HIV resistance um, data that public health professionals are using to map the sexual and social networks of people living with HIV in order for them to better implement certain HIV treatment and prevention resources and, and, and distribute them throughout the community. Um, next slide. And then we have actually this, this is, you know, I won't take credit for this very messy graph. This is from the CDC themselves. Um, but this, this graph kind of breaks down a little bit about how maybe you as a patient, uh, maybe perhaps newly diagnosed with HIV, how, how you relate to the MHS system, to the molecular HIV system, uh, molecular HIV surveillance system. Your provider will order a drug resistance test. Um, because it's a one-on-one -on -one engagement between you as a patient and as a person living with HIV and your medical provider. And they, you know, it's their obligation to prescribe you the most effective cocktail of drugs, et cetera, to, to treat your, your, um, to treat um, HIV. And what, what happens after that is there is a genetic sequence created um, in doing that HIV drug resistance test. And that, that sequence is then transferred and reported up to state and local health departments and the CDC who are doing what is what they call cluster detection and response or CDR activities, which is really just conducting molecular analysis of closely related strains of HIV um, in order, as I said, their rationale is to guide public health action to, to best serve communities of people living with HIV. But I think a lot of you might be wondering, well, why haven't I heard about this? Why didn't I know that my own individual drug resistance data is being used to map networks of people living with HIV? Or maybe, you've, or maybe you're already aware of this and you're, you're rightfully upset. And I think that's what we're really here to talk about today. Um, next slide. So um, because HIV is actually such a rapidly evolving virus, uh, there are slight variations as it, as it moves from one person to another. And that is actually, it's actually that quirk of HIV that enables um, molecular HIV surveillance to, to happen. Um, so basically public health professionals can make inferences about how, just how closely two people's um, H strains of their own individual um, virus are, how, make inferences about how related they are to each other. And that is really the nature of what the CDC is calling, a like a, what, what would qualify as a cluster. Um, um, and this actually, you know, uh, varies a little bit uh, between, you know, the CDC has for a long time been doing time-space cluster analysis, which doesn't rely on the use of molecular data or your, you know, the the H, the the drug resistance data um, that is reported and analyzed by state and local health departments by the CDC. Um, but then there is this other type of molecular analysis or molecular molecular cluster analysis that they can do as well. Um, next slide. Uh, 
And, you know, I, I won't spend too much time on this slide because I, I think actually we're going to talk a little bit about some of these resources in a, in a moment. But I just wanted to take a moment uh, and reflect about how, how incredible the advocacy, the momentum, the mobilization has been amongst the community, right? I mean, the CDC basically orders every grantee, which is essentially you could think about it as like a state or local health department, has ordered them in order for them to get HIV prevention funding, they have to collect, analyze, and report HIV molecular data without any buy-in or knowledge from communities of people living with HIV. There's been a, a, an enormous rupture of momentum, there been numerous resources. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. Um, you know, I really just want to, to highlight the, the amazing work of um, of the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus, of PWN USA, um, the AIDS United Public Policy Council has released a position statement and recommendations. Um, we have Justin Smith from Pacha here, so I won't dig in too deeply into that. But, but basically, we have a journey of advocates, of people living with HIV, of lawyers and, and experts in public health who have been raising the alarm and have been documenting the concerns, have been documenting the risks, have been sharing recommendations for years, right? And I think we can't lose sight of that here. I, I really want us to not lose sight of the fact that we've been making noise for years and CDC has to listen to you. Um, next slide. Um, you know, I think uh, there's some very serious major areas of concern regarding the risks that molecular HIV sur surveillance might pose to people living with HIV. And some of those risks uh, include criminalization, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there's, there's the issue of data security and privacy, which is deeply related to uh, concerns about HIV criminalization. But then there are also other concerns, which you know, are deserving of their own webinar, right? The, the issue of consent and bodily autonomy, right? Um, that, that your own individual drug resistance data that you know that's obtained from a test that your your provider does in order to prescribe you the best drugs as an interaction between provider and patient how that data is then superseded and used outside of that scope without your knowledge or consent to to map networks of people living with HIV that's concerning right and it's especially concerning that your consent, your informed consent, your, your right to bodily autonomy isn't really being respected in that, in that equation. Um, there's also the issue whether this is the best use of scarce public health resources, right? I think a lot of us might be aware of some news that was going around in the Ciro li uh, Network listserv about the Tennessee Department of Health um, abruptly refusing HIV prevention funding. Right, and, and I think there are a lot of people in public health who are worried about whether this is the best use of scarce public health resources. There's also the issue of stigma, the language that's used, the, the, the issue of people at CDC and public health professionals not really engaging in a good faith way with, with communities of people living with HIV. Um, next slide, thank you. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna try and speed up a little bit because I know we have so many great presenters here. This is just a snapshot. Um, it's it's the CHLP map showing where uh, you know people living with HIV are criminalized, whether through HIV specific laws, whether through sentencing enhancements, um, primarily affecting, for example, sex workers, or whether your state criminalizes people living with HIV with general criminal laws, things like reckless endangerment, aggravated assault, assault with a deadly weapon. Um, so we can see, right, that, that this is still a major issue, despite the fact that a number of states have reformed or repealed these laws. Um, next slide. And the, the fears that your own medical data, your private identifiable medical data might fall into the wrong hands are real. They are realistic fears. So don't ever let anyone in a state or a local health department or the CDC tell you that your fears aren't realistic, that you're not being rational. Because if, if we go to the next slide, I think we can really see the breadth of data breaches. Um, I mean, I, I'd like us to, you know, nearly half of all residents in several states affected by a health data breach in 2021 
And in that, uh, actually this is 2022 data, or the, yeah, this even includes 2022 data on this bottom graph. If we can look at hacking incidents accounted for 16% of data breaches in 2016, but 82% of data breaches uh, just last year. And, and that actually, that data doesn't include after March of 2022. So the fears of data falling into the wrong hands are very, very realistic. Next slide. And there's been actually some really troubling trends uh, in health data hacks. So there's a cybersecurity firm, Critical Insight. They release every year a report called the Healthcare Breach Report. Roughly 20 million people affected by a health data breach in the first half of the last year alone. Healthcare providers accounted for, you know, uh, almost three quarters of all breaches. But what I'd like us to, to focus on and to ground us today is, is a shift that hackers are, <laughs> are doing. Um, hackers are shifting from hacking large hospital systems that have more security. And they're focusing more on what uh, Critical Insight calls specialty clinics. Um, so we can see that specialty clinics were top source of, of data breaches last year accounting for 31% of data breaches, up from 23% the prior year. And I think a lot of us know that our communities often interface with smaller clinics um, um, and their own diagnostic labs. This is, I think, a, I think you know, a, a real um, blind spot in the CDC's um, response to community concerns about molecular HIV surveillance. Um, next slide. And despite what people in public health might tell you that this data is, you know, rigorously de-identified, there's been numerous studies. This one's actually quite old. So there are newer studies confirming this, that it is very easy to re-identify de-identified data. And if we consider just for a moment the enormous resources that are at the disposal of law enforcement agencies, right, their, their budgets continue to balloon. Uh, in the face of cuts in municipalities and cities across the, the country, cutting funding for libraries and social support services and mental health care services and, and education. But you know what? You know who gets continues to get more and more funding? Police and prosecutors. And, and if, we, if we just think about the enormous resources at their disposal, it's not a stretch of the imagination uh, that they might be able to really easily re-identify, de-identified medical data. Um, next slide. Um, you know, there is a number of states, um, this is just really, a, a, you know, a few of them that have state laws, you know, it is in the state law in these states uh, for public health professionals and for state health departments to cooperate in prosecutions against people living with HIV, to share data with prosecutors and with law enforcement. Uh, this, this includes HIV molecular data, but this is obviously goes much broader than that. This is, this is about a real issue of lane crossing between public health and law enforcement, and the fact that we don't really have any rigid barriers there. And this is something that I think a lot of us, the, the, the caucus, PWN, CHLP, and others have been calling for for years. So this is just a few states, Ohio, Tennessee, Arkansas. Um, next slide, thank you. Uh, Maryland, South Carolina, Indiana. I, I think Louisiana also has a very similar provision in their state law. Um, and many state and health departments cooperate with law enforcement uh, routinely, right? R regardless of whether there's a state law compelling them to do so. Um, next slide. Um, NASDAQ has actually compiled some of this data in a really helpful map. Uh, there's the, the source for the website where you can find these maps. These are states that allow health departments to rele release HIV data to law enforcement. You can see it's not just one or two states. It's a lot of states. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see the states that do not even have a law explicitly requiring a court order to release data. And, you know, I, I'm not an attorney, but I work with attorneys. We have attorneys here. They will tell you just how easy it is to obtain a court order in the first place. 
But these states don't even require a court order <laughs> for prosecutors and law enforcement uh, to, to gain access to data. Um, and if, if you think about EHE jurisdictions, there's a lot of overlap here between EHE jurisdictions and these states that do, are not protecting your data and are risking your, your, your lives, really. Um, next, next slide. And I, I'd like to touch really briefly uh, on, on HIPAA. I think a lot of people in public health and, and, uh, and elsewhere will tell you that HIPAA protects the confidentiality and privacy of your medical data. Well, the sad, the, the, the sad reality is there are an enormous carve-outs in HIPAA, and one of them is explicitly for law enforcement, right? There are, there are exceptions in, 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 uh, in HIPAA that do make sense, um, uh, you know, um, you can see some of them here actually or for in emergency situations you maybe want to make sure that your medical data is shared with with the emergency personnel with wherever you're transferred but law enforcement that doesn't make a lot of sense that doesn't make a lot of sense especially given the legacy of hiv criminalization and anti-blackness and, and punishing and brutalizing sex workers and queer communities that is the reality of law and policy in the united states so this is this is a major issue here. Um, next slide. Um, this is more just kind of about how state laws usually protect the confidentiality and prohibit the release of identifiable data, except, guess for who? Law enforcement. <laughs> um, uh, or for law enforcement to do a bunch of these things. Um, next slide. And this, you know, I think this can really just help us you know, visualize what should be completely separate entities, right? Because CHLP and I think a lot of other organizations represented here are abolitionist organizations. Um, but at the very least, you, you, sh you we should have very separate systems of protecting public safety and protecting public health on the other side. And what a lot of these gaps in protecting your data illustrate is that there's a lot of lane crossing here public health professionals cooperating in prosecutions. We saw this with the Michael Johnson prosecution. We saw this with the new Sean Williams prosecution, health departments working with, working with law enforcement uh, in a HIV related prosecutions. This is, and what, what I think advocates have been calling for right now and, and, and what they've been calling for for years is a firewall forbidding the release of information between public health and law enforcement. Um, next slide, which which obviously goes bigger uh, than just HIV molecular data, right? Um, this is really about that issue of lane crossing, about protecting the fragile pub public trust that still exists uh, in public health. But we cannot have public trust in public health if our communities aren't protected. And I'd love for us in this discussion, and I'm going to hand this off here because I know I've gone a little bit over time. For us to expand our understanding of HIV criminalization, it's not just about criminal legal systems, it's medical and public health systems that work together, that interlock, that coordinate with each other, um, that are a part of the legacy of anti-Black racism and criminalizing and pun punishing poverty, um, uh, punishing the other, the tradition of stripping bodily autonomy and eroding the rights of marginalized people, of stigmatized people, um, and I'd love for us to really think more expansively about HIV criminalization to include molecular HIV surveillance in that, in that picture. Um, and then, you know, thank you. I'm, I had one more slide, but I think I'm going to pass it on just it, for the sake of time. Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, um, and I will pass it off to, I think, Justin's next. Yes. Thank you, Amir. And I just want to also... Um, Thank the caucus for inviting me to, to speak here this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, I'm Justin Smith, I use he, him pronouns. I am the director of the Campaign to End AIDS at Positive Impact Health Centers, which is an HIV service organization in Atlanta. And I also serve as one of the co-chairs of the Stigma and Disparity Subcommittee of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS or PACHA. Um, and just to give some background about how Pacha has come into this conversation, um, as Amir framed up, um, this has been a long-standing uh, concern 
in a conversation within the community, uh, in even at the Pacha table, um, there have been many presentations that have been before Pacha about molecular HIV surveillance and its people's concerns about its implementation. And, and so hearing that concern and also not seeing that there's been a lot of movement on the issue from some of our federal colleagues, we really wanted to step in and say, how do we actually move the conversation in a way that is productive? And so what we decided to do was to hold a convening um, where we can really get into the weeds about everything related to MHS and cluster detection. Uh, in Atlanta back in May, uh, we brought together a really fantastic group of advocates, many of the people on this call, in conjunction with uh, health department colleagues, people from CDC and other parts of the federal HIV apparatus, um, came together in Atlanta. We were facilitated very ably by Ronald Johnson, who is here on the call, and Nanette Benbow uh, served as our facilitators for the day. And really what we wanted to do with this uh, two-day convening was come out with a series of recommendations that would then be submitted for consideration um, to the Pacha Stigma Disparity Subcommittee for consideration. And what we would do then is develop those into a series of recommendations that could be put before the full council uh, for consideration for adoption. And so um, this was a lengthy process, um, but we really tried to be intentional about, about engaging, particularly networks of people living with HIV uh, throughout the process. Next slide, please. So um, back in October, uh, we were ready as the Stigma and Disparity Subcommittee to present our uh, resolution for uh, consideration by the full council. And we are proud to say that this resolution was unanimously decided upon and voted on and for exception uh, uh, by the full Pacha. And so that was very exciting. Um, because you never know when you put stuff before a body if you know, everyone's gonna sort of get on board. But I think what that kind of unanimous vote um, says is that you know, we really are on the side of people living with HIV on this issue. Um, and we really want to push as hard as we can to uh, sort of get some change here from our federal colleagues. What I will say is that um, Pacha is an advisory body, we are not, regulatory, um, so we don't actually have the power to force CDC to do anything. Uh, we can recommend strongly, which is what we did in this uh, resolution. And so I'll just kind of go over some of the, the highlights and I'll make sure that if folks haven't seen the full text, um, that that is something that is shared as a resource that goes out after this call. So I think it's important that folks within um, kind of this space uh, have access to the specific language, because I think that can be helpful for ongoing advocacy efforts that folks may want to engage in both at the federal and also at the state and local levels. So essentially what we recommended was that CDC really update its guidance about MHS um, through the NOFO process, which is what kind of is the flagship uh, funding opportunity that CDC gives to fund health departments in our country. And I just want to highlight a couple of the things that we recommended. Um, so I think what we heard loud and clear from networks of people living with HIV is that the initial rollout of this was really done without meaningful engagement. And so we have to correct that uh, moving forward, there has to be meaningful involvement of not just people living with HIV, but specifically we called out that they have to be people living with HIV, but also people that are part of networks of people living with HIV. Um, that has to be something that is involvement in the process from this point forward. Um, and so in that conversation has to be about whether or not this is actually something that we want to move forward with. So what we also heard loud and clear is that there is tremendous variation in our country with respect to the legal environments that exist. So the slide that Amir helpfully pointed out in his presentation, what happens in Massachusetts looks very different than what happens in 
Louisiana. And so what we were really arguing for in this resolution is that it should be up to kind of local uh, local jurisdictions um, to decide whether or not this is something that they have the ability from a lot of different standpoints, from the legal environment, from a resource standpoint, from the buy-in from people living with HIV, if this is something that collectively actually makes sense. Um, so that's you know sort of the gist of that sort of set of recommendations. Uh, one of the things we also called for is, um, again, the resource allocation piece of it. What we haven't seen to date is, um, as Amir pointed out in his talk, you know, there is sort of traditional time space methods of uh, surveillance, and then they have this sort of MHS. And we haven't actually seen uh, evidence produced by CDC within the peer reviewed literature that MHS is somehow better. Um, and so I think if we're going to try to make that, or CDC is trying to make that argument, they need to actually show some evidence. Um, and so that's something else that we also called for. Um, we also want to make sure that um, people living with HIV are aware of the types of surveillance activities that are happening in their community. So I see in the chat that there's lots of people that are like, I didn't even know this was happening. And so there has to be a better process of um, both sort of information, but also this piece around informed consent, right? Um, and that's a, a, a black box in many ways, but I think we have to go there and try to figure out what are the actual things that we can do to make sure that people living with HIV are able to say, you know what, I don't want my data being used for this, right? And to give people the option and the choice if that's what they, if they say, hey, I actually am okay with this, then that's something different. But to not have the conversation with your provider that, um, so that you know what's actually being used with your data is something that has to, has to change. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So again, so I, I think, what we have to also make sure of is that, again, make the argument. If CDC is saying we we're going to do this, we have to put them on the hook for providing the evidence that this is actually something that's useful, particularly within the communities that are most impacted by HIV. Um, and so this analysis of the added benefit, if any, um, of this tool compared to what's already existing within sort of our traditional surveillance uh, methodologies. Again, I think this process has to be done in lockstep with community um, to really build this better and stronger system of informed consent about how molecular data are used. Next slide, please. And then I, I think we also have an affirmative uh, duty, uh, we being folks in sort of the federal apparatus, to also push as hard as you can on this criminalization issue. We know that that is a state level issue in many ways, but I really want us to be creative and thoughtful about how we actually engage the full weight of what the federal government can do to try to uh, really get these laws off the books in the states where they exist, uh, and really to educate sort of the legal apparatus about the danger of these types of laws and the harm that they can cause to people living with HIV. Um, and so we really wanna make sure that the federal government is really a partner in pushing to uh, repeal these laws that we know are so devastating and harmful and actually antithetical to the goals of uh, really improving the lives of people living with HIV, but also to the goals of ending the HIV epidemic, if that's something that we're really serious about. These laws really um, do not serve that purpose. And so really trying to put federal officials on notice that there's an affirmative obligation to make uh, lawmakers in states know that these laws are outdated, they're stigmatizing, and again, they're counterproductive to the work that we say that we're supposed to be doing. Um, next slide, please. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Kelly Flannery from PWN, who will take us home. Kelly? Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, I really appreciated you going over the PACHA recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna start off, hey y'all, Kelly Flannery, she, her, hers. Um, I'm the policy director at PWN. Um, for those of you who don't know, 
PWN is the only national organization led by and for women, cis and trans women, and gender non-binary people living with HIV. PWN is also an anchor network of the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus and co-chairs the AIDS United Public Policy Council's MHS Committee, which I'll get back to in a couple of slides. Um, so I want to start off by saying that when the Pacha resolution came out, there was like a collective cheer at PWN. Now, we're spread throughout the nation, so it happened through chats, but it was more like ping, 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 ping. Like, everyone was thrilled. It really was a huge victory, and we're grateful to the work and intentionality that Justin and everyone on the Pacha Stigma and Disparities Subcommittee put into getting this resolution unanimously approved. Unanimously, it's huge. Um, it felt like a real recognition of the years of work. And these are years of work that happened before I was at PWN, that networks of people living with HIV, human rights advocates, advocacy organizations, and others have put into raising the alarm about the potential harms of MHS, right? So it's been about five years since 2018 when the CDC announced that a MHS would be a mandatory component of HIV prevention funding. And as I think Amir made clear, we've been clear. We've been clear for a while now with what the CDC needs to do. Um, and so what you're looking at on the screen right here is Demanding Better. And someone's going to drop a link to Demanding Better. If you haven't seen it yet, please check it out. Demanding Better is the first set of policy recommendations created collaboratively by all national networks of people living with HIV in the US. So it really provides like a, a clear roadmap for the federal government for how to strengthen the overall federal HIV response. And specifically, Demanding Better gives us a focus on structural and social drivers of health, including dismantling oppressive discriminatory systems and addressing the effects of understandable medical mistrust. So changing the approach to MHS is one core component of Demanding Better. In there, and what you see on the screen, are two full pages of recommendations for specific agencies, including the CDC, that align with what Justin just went over. Next slide, please. And so along with Demanding Better and the US People Living with HIV Caucus, other allied organizations have also been making recommendations. So on here, you see HIV Justice Worldwide's A Global Review of Human Rights Implications of MHS. You see the CHLP uh, one pager on MHS, the US People Living with HIV uh, Caucus Moratorium Demand, as well as the AIDS United's PPC position statement. I'm not going to go over all of these, but we are going to drop links to them in case you want to learn more. But basically, the point is, this is just a smattering. This is just a couple of uh, position papers to show that we, multiple organizations, coalitions, collectives, and thanks to PACHA, governmental advisory bodies, have created clear and consistent recommendations for how to address the serious harms posed by MHS and CDR. This includes, next slide, please the AIDS United Public Policy Council. Um, a little bit of background on the PPC. It brings together organizations from across the US. Uh, these organizations advocate for or serve on behalf of people living with HIV or people vulnerable to HIV. It has more than 50 members across 18 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Um, I feel very lucky to co-chair the MHS committee with Benjamin Brooks, who's the Associate Director of Policy and Education at the Whitman Walker, Walker Institute. Also, shout out to Amir, who is on that uh, committee with us as well. Um, so we drafted and the full PPC adopted in July, and we submitted to the CDC a very specific set of recommendations for how the CDC could and should use upcoming funding opportunities to address concerns about MHS, right? If the federal government is funding state and local health departments to engage in surveillance practices, they have an obligation to ensure that the right to informed consent, privacy rights, and the human rights of people living with HIV are better secured. Um, so now, as you can see, if you're reading on the screen, the recommendations that you're going to find in the AIDS United PPC um, are similar to and overlap with the PACHA resolution. Um, and so this really includes steps that CDC needs to take along the lines of strengthening community oversight and accountability, right? Ensuring that people living with HIV from communities most subject to surveillance, policing, and criminalization are meaningfully included in the development oversight and administration of HIV-related data collection, use and storage, and sharing. Um, really, like the federal government, including the CDC, needs to improve their community consultation and engagement overall. And this needs to include if and when new technologies roll out. 
Uh, the next two really were well covered in Amir and Justin's presentations. We heard about the immense variation in state uh, legal standards and privacy practices. Uh, the practice of molecular HIV surveillance and cluster detected, detection is applied to already marginalized and criminalized communities. So this includes sex workers, people who use drugs, queer and trans people, migrants, and people experiencing homelessness. The data about HIV transmission networks that's being shared creates the risks of inadvertent disclosure, heightened stigma, risks of interpersonal violence, state-sanctioned violent violence, and criminalization. So to improve trust in public health and surveillance systems, the CDC needs to reduce variation by pursuing uniformity in electronic data storage and privacy protections across jurisdictions. Um, as Amir really went over and Justin did as well, um, we need strong firewalls that are gonna protect all public health research and surveillance data from use outside of that scope without written informed consent. Public health data should not be flowing to cops, should not be flowing to ICE. This is a radical breach of public trust in public health systems. Um, we're also demanding informed consent for participation in MHS. Uh, another truly appalling component of MHS that we heard about is that it's done without informed consent and oftentimes without even the knowledge of people living with HIV. So we're calling on the CDC to work with networks of people living with HIV, uh, HIV care service and advocacy organizations and other stakeholders to establish a process to obtain informed consent from people living with HIV before HIV genomic se se sequence data is collected, analyzed, or stored. And this needs to include the right to object. Um, guide reporting on cluster investigations. Uh, so one of the ways that we've seen the harms of MHS really play out in the US is through media reporting. So we've seen reports that identify quote, HIV clusters. Um, and I put that in quotes because that is a term that is used, but what it really means is people, people living with HIV, um, clusters are people. And so it identifies these transmission networks in specific communities, like trans women, homeless people, people who use drugs in specific limited areas. PWN's co-director, Nana, points out a truly horrifying example where media outlets named the exact street in Seattle that homeless people were living on in reporting on a transmission network. This is dangerous and stigmatizing reporting that puts folks in those communities at increased risk. And the CDC can and must provide recommendations for media when reporting on public health stories. And then finally, you'll see um, addressing MHS and injection drug use. Um, as I've noted multiple times, the practice of the MHS often applies to people who use drugs and specifically injection drugs. Um, the CDC must include the leadership of people who inject drugs in designing the strategies and tactics that work to end the stigmatization and criminalization of drug use. These only further marginalize communities and create structural barriers that prevent access to care. Next slide. I created this meme. Um, so we know what's wrong. We know what's needed to fix it. We've said it over and over again in multiple spaces and told the CDC, but we are still waiting for change. So it's really time, beyond time, to demand accountability from the CDC. We are done waiting. They need to put the POTRA resolution and the recommendations we've been making in, into effect. They need to put them into practice. Next slide. And we're going to do it through love. Um, so I want to see in the chat if y'all are fired up and ready to love on people living with HIV, because that's what we're planning. We are planning a set of actions that are really based in love and community. Next slide, please. All right, so pull up your calendar. Here's our schedule of events that are coming to you. Uh, first up is a community conversation. That's Tuesday, February 7th at 6 o'clock Eastern, uh, 5 o'clock Central, 4 o'clock Mountain, 3 o'clock Pacific. The registration link should be dropped in relatively soon. Um, the community conversation is specifically for people living with HIV. Uh, this is kind of a come as you are conversation. So it's the beginning of a conversation and is appropriate for people at all levels of understanding. So whether you know a lot about MHS and you're super informed, or this is a relatively new conversation to you, if you're a person living with HIV, show up, we'll do a quick grounding on MHS, and then we're going to open it up for a meaningful conversation about the real life impacts of MHS and medical surveillance generally. And then the next week, 
is going to be our Valentine's Day week of action. Um, we're going to be tweeting at the CDC. We're going to be sending them Valentines that show your love and support for people living with HIV and the human rights of people living with, with, living with HIV. And then the week after that, um, let's say you're on this call, you're not a person living with HIV, you wish you could have gone to the community conversation but can't, show up for HIV criminalization in the era of mass surveillance. Uh, that's gonna be a panel on Tuesday, February 21st at six o'clock Eastern, three o'clock Pacific. The registration link will be dropped. Um, but there's gonna be a whole bunch of different experts at that panel. There's gonna be subject matter experts, people with expertise in legal matters, in um, the public health field. Uh, advocates, we're going to try and really show the breadth of people who are engaged in MHS and demanding change. And we encourage you to be there and join us for the conversation. And so with that, I think I pass it back to Ronald. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks to Amir and to Justin for these incredible presentations. Uh, it really fulfills what I and the caucus hoped to have uh, on this webinar, this Road to Hynak series, uh, just to really get us focused and to make sure that when we talk about HIV criminalization, that the issues that were raised tonight around molecular HIV surveillance, cluster detection, these are very real. They're not hypothetical issues but they are issues that are affecting and can affect so many of our lives. And as, as was clear in all three messages, we need to know about this. We need to have the knowledge, we need to know how this affects us and how we can respond. And again, I'm uh, really very, very thankful to Amir, Justin and, and Kelly but also very thankful to all of you who are participating in tonight's webinar. And we want to note and next slide. Again, this is a, a part of the prelude and leading up to the HIV is not a crime national Ac training academy. Uh, we will be in person this year. We Hope to be, we had hoped to be in person last year, but we all know what happened. Uh, but we are planning an in-person uh, HINAC uh, in June uh, and taking place in Virginia. Uh, there is the information on uh, registering and scholarships. The process for scholarships is open and we urge everyone to, to register, to apply for a scholarship and attend uh, HINAC. HINAC will be June 4 to 7 uh, in Emory, Virginia, uh, Emory and Henry uh, College in Virginia. Uh, and we'll keep uh, and make sure that everyone uh, gets the information. And thank you, Kevin. Uh, Kevin has put the dates in the uh, chat box, June 4 to 7 of this year in Emory, Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we want to end the remaining time. I, this has been a such a rich discussion. This, discussion and, and pre set of presentations. Uh, next slide, uh, any questions? Uh, and if you have questions, put them in the chat box. Uh, I know there has been, just to get us started, some concern expressed and get some of the panelists to uh, get their reaction that in getting knowledge, which we need to have about MHS, how can we guard against, or what should we do uh, in educating people so that we don't at the same time discourage people from getting tested, discourage them, people from dropping out of uh, and not getting linked to care. So I'd be very interested if any of uh, our panelists have thoughts about how we need to inform, we need to educate, but we also need to get people tested. We also need to keep people in care. What do we, how do we address that? 
Any thoughts? Don't tell me I've stumped you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ronald, I can, you know, um, share, you know, something we have been talking about uh, in the networks is that it really does seem that the onus is on us as people living with HIV to be able to share uh, this information in an effective way. Um, people just simply don't know and knowledge is power. Um, I think somebody put in the chat how they were going to go and ask the next time they went to, um, you know, the doctor about, you know, how uh, if their data has been shared and it has been shared without their consent or if they've signed a consent um, that they weren't even aware that they were signing. So, um, you know, for all the people that are present here, we we are looking to ensure that we can share this information through your networks, through your platforms. So as has already been said, please feel free to reach out to us on any of the panelists if you'd like to share this information with your constituents. And we, as the people living with HIV caucus, are also planning on doing some information sessions that we'll let you know about in due course. Thank you. Go ahead, Jess, uh, Kelly. Yeah, I can. Um, I also just want to put out there that a, a public health system that's based off of not telling people the full and honest truth is not one that's like going to actually survive well or serve the needs of people. Um, and so I think this this question really revolves around informed consent, and that should be a non-negotiable. Um, this is a bedrock foundation of trust in the public health system. And by not having a system of informed consent, the CDC is actually leaning into medical mistrust by trying to deceive people, by not trying fully informing them of what's happening to their data. Um, I can't stress that enough. And so I really think this is on the CDC to reckon with the ways that they've created a system that's alienating people from their own health data. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Robert? Yes. I would, hi, everyone. I would just like to say that we do have four questions in, or at least three questions and a comment in the chat and in the Q&A. Uh, this is okay. Uh, yes. So can we clarify, uh, we are saying your drug resistant information um, is reported. Uh, are we saying that your drug resistance information is reported or is it actual the genetic profile of your virus, which includes the mutations and drug resistance? So which is it? Uh, thank you, Ronald. I, I, I mean, Robert, I, I, I did see that. Um, question. I, I actually, I mean, I can't name call them because it looks like they're anonymous, but I think they're right. I, I think, I think they're exactly right that um, it is the genotypical data, genotype data from, you know, uh, that's extracted from a drug resistance test, but it is that full profile, that viral profile that's used to do molecular analysis. So thank you, uh, anonymous attendee. Um, uh, <laughs> I wish I could thank you personally, but yes, I think you're, you're exactly right. And there's another question. Do you have data on health department data breaches? So, um, I can drop a link to the critical insight, uh, report, but what, what, what they're doing and what others have done is really just analyze HHS data. So the, the federal Department of Health and Human Services actually tracks data breaches themselves, and they might be, um, you know, going straight to the source is probably a, a, a good idea. Um, so I can try and quickly fish for a link before we end um, the webinar in a few minutes and try and, and drop them in the chat, but it's a great question. All right, next question. How does or has the federal government respond when recommendations are su submitted? So I'll take a stab at this and recommendations can be, I'll just speak about what happens with patch recommendations. Um, and I'll say specifically what's happened with this 
set of recommendations. Um, so what I can tell you is that um, after the recommendations are passed by Pacha, that gets passed on to the Secretary of Health. Um, we actually had a briefing with uh, Admiral Levine, who's the Assistant Secretary of Health, about the recommendations and about MHS a couple of weeks ago. And the next step for us at Pacha is to actually um, have a meeting with CDC leadership to basically check in and sort of see how or you know sort of what their take is on the recommendations that we've made to them. Um, there's a fine line that we as Pacha have to walk because again we're not a regulatory body, so again we can't force them, but we can ask and, and sort of get that query. Uh, the other thing is that you know um, networks also have the capacity to ask for meetings, and so I think that's another strategy that uh, can be on the table in terms of helping to move this conversation forward. Um, so that's what I'll say about kind of that component of the process. I don't know if other folks want to jump in. And I have one last, it's sort of a comment, but we can make it into a question, which is probably something that should be a webinar in itself and around HIPAA. HIPAA does not protect you in law, but should. Any thoughts on to that uh, comment question? Um, I, I could try and respond to that. I had actually shared with Ami and, and Kelly some um, you know, advocacy that we did here locally in DC, where it was very explicit that HIPAA did not protect in this case. I mean, that was one of the things that came up. And so we had to ask for a specific re recommendation that showed that made the DC Health Department commit that they would not share um, that information in, in essentially legal cases. So at least I can be very confident in agreeing that HIPAA does not cover this type of thing and that those firewalls that Amir was talking about are really critical, um, that we need to advocate for those so that our data does not cross lines without very explicit consent or due process. And that's the questions that we have so far. So thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And again, thanks to all of you who provided uh, some questions that give further insight into not only the issues uh, surrounding MHS and cluster, de uh, cluster detection and HIV criminalization, but more importantly, what we can and what we should uh, do about it to protect ourselves, to protect our community, uh, to protect everyone uh, who is affected uh, by this epidemic, which is nearly everyone. Uh, so uh, again, uh, hope you can attend and register for HINAC so that we can uh, continue this discussion. The activities that Kelly outlined coming up, uh, including uh, the community conversation of the webinar and our Valentine's Day message to CDC on how they can show us their love for our community. These are all the things that you can do uh, that we can do together to, to make sure that the kinds of issues, the kinds of problems, the kinds of threats, and I'll use that word very deliberately, that we discussed tonight are, we will have next year, we can have real progress in saying how they have been addressed. We can restore and rebuild the kind of trust in the public health service systems. Uh, to trust that when we take care of our health by getting tested, by seeing our doctors, that our privacy, our bodily autonomy are protected. So that's the task that all of us have. And it's the road to HINAC. It's the road to the week of action. It's the road beyond. And thank you so much for being here tonight. And again, thanks. Thanks, thanks to our panelists. Thank you, Martha, for joining me in uh, welcoming and hosting this on behalf of the, the caucus. And thank you and hope you all have 
a good evening or the balance of the afternoon for our West Coast friends. But take care, everyone. Bye-bye.